thank everybody for coming. Uh, this event today is the first session in a four-part session uh, of our uh, seminar series, uh, Economics for the Clueless Scientists. Uh, this event is organized by the Penn Science Policy and Diplomacy Group, or PSPDG. Uh, PSPDG is a student group that provides opportunities for students and other early career scientists at the University of Pennsylvania to get hands-on training and experience in the fields of science communication, policy, and diplomacy. You can visit our website at pspdg.com or follow us on Twitter at UPenn Science Poll. And I have the same little intro stuck into the chat just in case you want to reference this later. Um, and today we are going to be starting off with uh, Stephanie Kelton's talk. Um, Stephanie Kelton is a professor of public policy and economics at Stony Brook University and a founding fellow at the Sanders Institute and a board chair of uh, econ economists for peace and security. In 2015, she served as the chief economist for the U.S. Senate Budget Committee. And in 2016 and 2020, she served as an economic advisor to the Bernie Sanders presidential campaign. One of her most recent pieces of scholarship, The Deficit Myths, was an instant New York Times bestseller. All in all, it's clear why Stephanie Kelton was recognized by Politico as one of the top 50 people nationwide who have helped transform American politics. So everybody, please welcome Dr. Stephanie Kelton. Well, thank you very much. And thank you uh, for inviting us both to be with you this evening. It is, uh, look, it's a great pleasure. And I really enjoy uh, having an opportunity to engage with groups like yours. Okay. You're not a group of economists. Don't sell yourself short when you say, I forget what you build this uh, event as, but the clueless or something. Listen, I, I'm quite confident that you know a whole heck of a lot about a lot of things that are important than I will ever uh, come close to knowing. So we may be clueless about different things, but I know that I'm with a, a very smart group of people and I'm happy to have an opportunity to talk with you about a little bit of what I consider my area of expertise. So let me dive in. I'm not gonna do a slideshow presentation. Those are all over the internet. You can Google my name and find uh, Lord knows how many you know public talks and I'm standing there going through slides. If that's what you're interested in after hearing some of what I have to say, there's lots out there you can, you can go and find, uh, including a TED talk, which might be interesting and useful as a way of just distilling the core concepts of MMT into something like 12 minutes. So uh, I just want to have kind of a conversation and I'm most interested in the exchange of ideas that will take place after this. So I'll, I'll talk for a little while. I, I don't know if I'll eat up 30 minutes, but we'll see what happens. Um, let me start by saying what I think are the important conclusions that I want to leave you with. You know, one of the things that the pandemic did, I believe, is to demonstrate in just all of its naked candor, right, how the federal government's budget works, why it's not like a household budget, how Congress was able to conjure into existence more than $5 trillion in the span of 12 months, just a year or so after uh, lawmakers told us that, you know, everything had to be paid for and there was no money to do big things. And we had fiscal crises looming into the future and that we all needed to be very worried about budget deficits and the debt and so forth. You know, think back to the presidential campaign, right, leading up to the 2020 elections. We all probably watched many of these debates. We saw a very crowded field of Democratic hopefuls, right? What were there, 17, 19 at one point in time, all vying to become the Democratic nominee. And each of them had, with varying degrees of ambition, a platform that they ran on. Cancel a little bit of student loan debt, cancel a good chunk, cancel all of it, do Medicare for all, do a Green New Deal or do some climate related investments, do this, do that, right? Everybody had a platform and everybody had a way to pay for all of the spending that they were proposing to do whether it was a $16 trillion Green New Deal or something far less ambitious, Democratic presidential hopefuls lined up and everybody laid out a blueprint for us and said, this is what we wanna spend and this is how we are prepared to pay for it. 
And almost all of it involved raising a variety of taxes, mainly on higher income earning uh, individuals, corporations, uh, and the very wealthy and so forth. And then we were told we would be in a position to afford to do these things, to tackle some of our biggest challenges. Okay, so fast forward, just a period of months, right? We get the election behind us. Uh, well, the pandemic happens even before the election, right? So the pandemic hits and in March of 2020, uh, we are told, before the election, the pandemic hits, and we are told that all of a sudden we can do $2.2 trillion in the form of the CARES Act, right? This fiscal package, the first big package that Congress uh, passed, committing $2.2 trillion. Where did it come from? How did they do it? There was no dragging of their feet, wringing of their hands, big, uh, you know, big debate about whose taxes were going to increase to allow this to happen and so forth. The votes were there. Congress wrote the bill, passed the legislation, and the money went out. And then they followed it up at the end of the year with $900 billion more. And then Biden is elected. And after the inauguration, the Democrats have the House, they have the Senate, they have the White House. And they deliver a $1.9 trillion package in the form of the American Rec uh, Rescue Plan Act, right? $1.9 trillion. So from March of 2020 to March of 2021, you get some $5 trillion committed from Congress to support the economy, to help us recover, support incomes and jobs and all the rest of it. And look at the results. We had the shortest recession in US history, now the shortest recession on recovery. Poverty fell for the first time. The economy went down. And instead of poverty increasing, poverty fell during the downturn. We, restore, we are restoring jobs at the fastest clip on record. We had a provision in the last major piece of legislation that lifted about 40% of all the children who were living in poverty in this country out of poverty, which is just a single provision called the child tax credit, right? And the list goes on and on. We did all of these things, and we did them in ways that we were told were essentially impossible. Spending must be paid for. Adding to the deficit will produce all of these terribly risky outcomes, including spiraling interest rates and the risk of default. And you know, you harken back to what happened to a number of countries in Europe after the financial crisis, 2007, 2008. And all of the sorts of things, the, the myths that were drilled into our heads over so many years and decades about fiscal policy, deficits, the national debt, just sort of started to fall away when the pandemic hit. And I think this was a very good thing, right? Imagine what the policy response would have looked like if we had allowed all of those things to hamstring us and to force us to do less than we were capable of doing, which by the way, is what happened after the financial crisis in 2007, 2008. The policy response from Congress, I'm talking about fiscal policy, was nowhere near as bold and ambitious as what we got this time around. And a big part of the reason why had to do with concerns about finding the money, about increasing deficits, adding to the debt. We were watching this debt crisis unfold in Europe and we were looking over there and you know, we had leading economists at the time telling us that if we don't get our fiscal house in order, the United States of America, we would end up like Greece, we would be next. So we did this pivot to austerity where we started hearing a focus on the need to reduce deficits, to avoid increasing the national debt, to get spending under control and all of that sort of stuff. And what happened? What happened is that we had the most anemic recovery on record coming out of the financial crisis. Jobs came back very slowly. It took about seven years to recover all of the jobs that were lost in the Great Recession. The fiscal policy response was weak. 
And as a consequence, the economic recovery was weak. And then you can draw conclusions about what happened in subsequent election cycles when after seven years, you know, we were still clawing back jobs and the jobs that were coming back were by and large inferior to the jobs that were lost. They were lower pay, lower hour jobs. Americans were dissatisfied and Democrats lost. Uh, so we start off very differently this time. You know, a much better fiscal response. The economy performs much better in terms of the aggregates, right? This is not to diminish um, a lot of hardship that many families continue to face, you know, in terms of getting jobs fully restored and, and the rest of it. But if you watched the State of the Union address last night, then you heard what I heard, which were six references to the deficit. I'm talking about the government deficit. Do you know how many references there were to the deficit in the prior four years of, well, the previous administration, those four State of the Union addresses? Zero in all four years, Donald Trump did not refer to the government deficit once in any State of the Union address. He referred to the trade deficit twice and he referred to our infrastructure deficit once. So in my book, I have a chapter, chapter seven is called The Deficits That Matter. And this is what I desperately hope that people like you, uh, you know, getting hopefully, you know, some new ways of thinking from Fadl and from me this evening and from others that you're going to bring in to participate in this. Hopefully, we're going to find a way to center the deficits that matter and to stay really focused on, you know, delivering an economic and a social agenda. Uh, that recognizes that the number that falls out of the budget box at the end of every year is not the thing to be preoccupied with. It's not the thing that matters. What matters are the real economic outcomes. Are we building and delivering a healthy economy? Do we have a balanced economy? Do we have enough jobs for everyone who wants to work? Can we keep inflation down? Can we keep levels of income and wealth inequality within tolerable bands? I'm not saying everything has to be perfectly equal, egalitarian distribution. I'm saying that the kind of inequities that exist today are simply far too extreme. They're bad for the way our economy operates and they're bad for the way our democracy functions. So we've got infrastructure deficits and God knows the climate deficit needs to top the list. We had uh, a report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change yesterday. I'm sure you know most, if not all of you saw that though. The sirens are getting louder and louder. The warnings are getting more and more dire. And, you know, there was $555 billion in the initial proposed Build Back, Build Back Better Act for climate-related investments. That amounts to just $55 billion or, or so annually. It would have been the biggest investment in climate that we've ever had in the United States of America, but at the same time, woefully inadequate given the magnitude of the challenges we face. So we need five to 10 times that amount. And until, unless and until we are able to break free of the old ways of thinking about the government's budget and what it means to be fiscally responsible and, and the rest of it, we're just never going to get there. And you've already seen it, right? We couldn't, the, the Democrats couldn't pass that bill. And in part, uh, concerns over deficits and the national debt are a reason why. Senator Manchin in particular raising those concerns. So let me just back up a step and tell you where MMT starts as a framework of analysis, right? We're economists, this is the macroeconomic framework that provides the lens through which we think about and evaluate, analyze uh, economic policy. So in a country like the United States, like Japan, like the UK, like Canada, right? Like China, well, these are countries that issue what we can call a sovereign currency, okay? So we have a monetary system in place today where the currency, our currency, the US dollar, is no longer tethered to gold, 
Okay? We don't have a fixed exchange rate system where the federal government says, we pledge to convert the currency, the dollar, into gold at a fixed price or into anything else at a fixed price, right? We don't have a currency that's tethered into something that we could run out of, something that's finite. We have a floating exchange rate fiat currency. And it's important because there is a degree of policy space that opens up when a country adopts a monetary system like the one we have today, leaving behind a fixed exchange rate system that robs you of that degree of policy space, okay? So one of the things that you want to recognize when you're talking about the spending capacity of a country like the United States is that you can never run out of money. You know, after 2007, 2008 financial crisis, I remember watching an interview with then President Barack Obama. And this is as the crisis was just unfolding. I mean, we were right there on the verge of a major economic meltdown. Deficits were beginning to explode because the economy was collapsing. When the economy collapses, the government's deficit automatically increases. Remember, the deficit is just the difference between two numbers, okay? One of the numbers is how many dollars the government spends into the economy each year. And the other number is how many dollars the government subtracts back out, mostly through taxation. So we have this idea that government deficits are inherently irresponsible, that it's evidence that the government is mismanaging its finances. Something's gone wrong. Why is the government budget in deficit? Don't, don't fall for that, okay? The government's budget in deficit means that it's adding more to the economy than it is subtracting away. So if the government has, let's say, a trillion dollar fiscal deficit, it means it is depositing a trillion dollars into some other part of the economy. Every deficit, every government deficit is good for someone. The question is, for whom and for what are those deficits being used, right? In whose interests are they operating? Are we using deficits to deal with our uh, you know, the climate change and our crumbling infrastructure and inadequate housing and health care? Are we using deficits to deliver windfalls to large corporations and the people at the top of the income distribution, which is what we did in 2017. Republicans did this, passing these huge tax cuts that overwhelmingly benefited those at the very top, right? Those who least need the help. But make no mistake, every deficit is good for someone. Hey, the question is for whom and for what are we using deficits? So you look back at President Obama commenting as the economy was melting down. He's asked, at what point do we run out of money? And he actually said to the American people on national television, we're out of money now. Those are his exact words. We're out of money now. And I remember that felt like a gut punch, right? Because I was among the people who had very high hopes uh, for what the Obama administration and Democrats would be able to do with respect to a wide range of uh, challenges, including climate. And as soon as those words came out of his mouth, I thought, well, you know, essentially there it goes. Uh, there goes the, the hope and change sort of, um, pitch just started to evaporate, right? So you've got to understand why being the issuer of the currency with a monetary system like the one we have today means never having to ask, how will we pay for it? That's the easy part. The easiest part of all of this is coming up with the money. Now, asterisk, right? If the votes are there, the money is there. And that's what we saw in 12 months time when Congress voted not once, not twice, but three times for major packages that kicked out $5 trillion without increasing taxes, without hand wringing about how to pay for it. They wrote the legislation, the votes were there and the money went out. So what you have to realize is if you can collect enough votes to pass a piece of legislation, the money will always be there. This is the easy part. The challenge, right, couple, twofold at least, 
finding the votes, securing the votes, when you have people like Senator Manchin or Senator Sinema uh, who don't want to vote for one reason or the other uh, because there are things in the proposed legislation that they don't like, then you obviously can't pass a bill if you don't have the votes. But suppose you get the votes. Then the challenge becomes managing the spending in a way that is responsible. So saying that the government doesn't have a financial constraint like the rest of us do, that its budget doesn't work like a household budget, that it can just commit to spending dollars that it does not have, is not the same as saying the government can just spend whatever it wants and never have to worry about anything because it can't go broke like a household or a private business. No, okay, there are limits, but the limit is not financial. It is not running out of money. It is not turning into grease. The relevant constraint, the thing to watch out for with respect to the government and its spending is inflation. We have real resource constraints on the supply side of the economy. There are capacity constraints. And if ever there was a time to illustrate that, it's now, right? Because we all see it every single day. We see the ships, you know, uh, trying to get in and offload at ports. We know that there are problems in trucking and freight and bottlenecks in the supply chain globally, you know, semiconductors and computer chips and all the rest of it. So we've, we've gotten this very kind of for horrible reasons, a global pandemic, a very beautiful illustration of both what it's possible for Congress and governments around the world to do when something is deemed a priority. The money can always be there. And a reminder of what where the real constraints are. They're in the supply side and the productive capacity of our economies. You can't run out of money, but you can run out of things to buy. And what we're dealing with right now are uh, a number of challenges, many of them related to supply chain and bottlenecks in production and the rest of it. So I don't mean to suggest that we have the inflation problem we have today because the deficits were too big. In fact, those that have looked at this and analyzed it, economists and others who have been doing this kind of research uh, are reaching the conclusion that in fact, the government fiscal policies, the packages that were passed, did a whole lot to hold the economy together, restore jobs and support uh, the recovery and so forth, but in fact added very little to inflationary pressures, that what's driving the current inflation is about other things, not about running fiscal policy too hot. But I am recognizing that one of the risks in you know, running the government's budget very aggressively to address climate change and other challenges we face is that you've got to be able to manage the spending and manage the strain on your productive capacity responsibly so that you don't trigger uh, an inflation problem in your economy. So those are big uh, sort of outline, uh, and I'm going to stop and turn it over to my esteemed colleague. Uh, yes. Yeah, before that, I would just like to, to uh, just uh, share some uh, resources with the audience. Yes, just for, you know, to, I guess, expand our learning. <laughs> our learning. Uh, yeah, let me just share this. Okay, got it. Yes, yeah. So I just want to highlight two books that uh, both our speakers have contributed to. First, The Deficit Myth. Uh, written by uh, Professor Kelton, New York Times bestseller, a great and very easily readable resource on modern monetary theory. And I think it'll be a great uh, purchase of, of a book if you want to uh, uh, learn about MMT in simple language and in a very uh, easy fashion. Uh, Professor uh, Kabub has also contributed to this excellent uh, book on uh, monetary, oh, sorry, uh, sovereignty in 21st century Africa, if you're interested in macroeconomics and how it applies to the global south and developing nations. We'd also like to share two books that are interested if some of you would like to really go in depth and learn more about uh, modern monetary theory. One is uh, Modern Money Theory, a Primer on Macroeconomics for Sovereign Monetary Systems 
by uh, L. Randall Ray, who's an eminent scholar of uh, MMT, and also uh, uh, an excellent book uh, by Stephen Hale about economics for sustainable uh, prosperity, which uh, draws on the intersection of uh, ecological economics and uh, with the uh, uh, modern monetary uh, theory. One last thing, you know, uh, if you attended this event, we still have three other upcoming events. Uh, one uh, on April 1st about innovation finance, financialization in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, another on April 7th with uh, another actually excellent MMT scholar, uh, Professor Pavlina Cherneva about uh, inequality. And uh, fourth event, I saw a question on the chat about carbon credits and so on. If you're if you're interested in how to tackle climate change and the details of the planning and the financing for how to uh, do that, session four on April 13th is the event uh, for you with uh, Jesse Jenkins and Robert Hockett. And with that, I'll leave the floor for Professor Fadel Kabul. Um, thank, you, thank you again for the invitation. Oh, go ahead, please. Oh, sorry, I was going to do just a quick introduction. Um, so, yeah, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, Dr. Fadhel uh, Kaboob is a associate professor of economics at Denison University and a president of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. His recent work focuses on the political economy of the uprisings in the Middle East. Dr. Kaboob's regional expertise is on the economies of the United States, Middle East, and North Africa, especially Tunisia. He is also a co-author of the book we showed uh, previously, Economic and Monetary Sovereignty in 21st Century Africa. So everybody, please welcome Dr. Fadhel Kaboob. Thank you. Thanks again for, for the kind invitation and for organizing this uh, very important series. I'm, I'm excited to be, uh, to be part of it. Um, I'm sharing my screen here. Can you confirm that you see the, the full screen? Yes. I can't see you. So yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Wonderful. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. So uh, what I wanted to cover today after Stephanie's excellent introduction to, to MMT here is a little bit of a, a look at the global south and at the climate crisis from an MMT perspective. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's frequently this idea that MMT only applies in a country like the US. Uh, and, and we're trying to challenge this idea with, with some specific uh, insight. So here we go. Let's see if we can do. So the starting point for the analysis for going into the global context is to understand the concept of monetary sovereignty and to understand that different countries have a different degree of monetary sovereignty. You have countries with no monetary sovereignty, a country like Ecuador that completely dollarized its economy and uses a foreign currency as a national currency. And then you have countries with very high degrees of monetary sovereignty, like the US, like Japan, like Canada, and, and so on, and lots of other developing countries sort of in between. And the question is, what determines where you sit on this spectrum of monetary sovereignty? This is really what we're getting into. And then based on the degree of monetary sovereignty, it will determine the spending capacity that the country has before it starts hitting the inflation pressure points. So the higher the degree of monetary sovereignty, the more fiscal spending capacity the government has with always an eye towards the risks of inflation, which I'll discuss uh, shortly. So a country with a high degree of monetary sovereignty is a country that issues its own national currency. That's the easy part. The second, thing is that it's a country that collects taxes in the same national currency. Most countries can do this. And it gets really tricky with the third and fourth conditions here. It's a country that only issues bonds denominated in the national currency. In other words, don't borrow and promise to pay in foreign currencies, in dollars and euros and, and other currencies. And that is the case for a lot of developing countries. And we'll talk about why that is the case and how we can uh, avoid uh, these traps. And number four, which is related to the issue of external debt, that is a country doesn't fix its exchange rate to the US dollar or to the euro or to any commodity like gold. In other words, you have a floating exchange rate 
or a flexible exchange rate. And we'll see why in many cases, developing countries are trapped into a situation where they find themselves forced into a fixed exchange rate system. And I'll talk about how we can undo these traps. And by undoing these traps, I mean gradually moving from a low degree of monetary sovereignty to a higher degree of monetary sovereignty. So here we go. Uh, a key distinction that Stephanie made uh, a few minutes ago that I'd like to highlight is a distinction between currency issuer and currency user. So don't try this at home. This is not for you know, individuals to go into a spending spree, and it's not for states or municipalities at the local level who are currency users to, to think in terms of monetary sovereignty, in terms of spending capacity. So this is for federal government, for a national government at the, at the national level. So a quick understanding of what uh, the situation is for developing countries. Developing countries typically have structural trade deficits, which lead to high external debt, meaning debt denominated in foreign currencies, usually dollars or euros or British pounds and so on. And the major root causes of this structural trade deficit that leads to this high external debt are three basic deficiencies. One is high levels of energy imports, and that is actually true even for countries that are uh, big oil exporters, uh, oil and gas exporters. Why? Because they typically export crude oil and then re-import the refined petrochemicals, the higher value added petrochemicals, gasoline, kerosene, and other petrochemicals for industrial uh, production. Number two, high levels of food deficit, very high dependence on imported food. Uh, and number three, the structural industrialization deficiency, whereby you have developing countries essentially specializing in assembly line type of manufacturing. In other words, they import high value added content, they import capital, they import the inputs, the intermediate components, and then they have low cost labor racing to the bottom to set up assembly line type of manufacturing. Or even worse than that, in terms of the lowest value added content of, uh, of production, it's literally extraction of natural resources for export with no value added. So when you add up these three traps, you end up with the structural trade deficit that puts downward pressure on the value of your currency relative to the dollar. So you have currency depreciation, and that currency depreciation literally means that your currency is cheaper or weaker relative to the dollar. So anything you're going to buy the next morning, whether it's food, whether it's medicine, whether it's computers or medical equipment, all of that is going to be imported at a much higher cost in real terms, which means you're importing inflation. So now you could face the potential of social and political unrest because people can't afford food, can't afford transportation or heating and cooling and, and so on. So that puts the government in a very difficult situation facing potent, potential social unrest. This is where the government has to intervene artificially to keep the value of their currency artificially stable. And that artificial stability is done basically by having the central bank or a foreign uh, or the Ministry of Finance essentially borrow in, in foreign currencies. Hi, Hi buddy. Can, some... can you go upstairs, please? <laughs> okay, later, please. Can you go upstairs? <laughs> um, so the, the currency depreciation essentially forces the government to stabilize the exchange rate by borrowing dollars and euros and as a result, accumulating external debt in order to stave off this potential instability related to food and fuel price inflation. So the mainstream economic model has a pretty standard answer to this, and it's basically austerity. The government needs to uh, reduce its spending, reduce its debt commitment, reduce the social subsidies for food and fuel and so on. Uh, debt restructuring, when you reach levels of external debt that have become unsustainable. My own country, Tunisia, is in this situation as we speak, negotiating with the IMF austerity plans and debt restructuring plans. Also on the table, privatizing state-owned enterprises where the government would sell the airport or the national airline company or whatever industry the, com the government controls. And the idea is to generate dollars to pay the external debt. Uh, market labor market flexibility, in other words, weaken labor unions, lower wages to attract more foreign investment into the economy, 
foreign investment or foreign direct investment, FDI and export-led growth become the key uh, strategies for developing countries that follow the, the mainstream approach, the IMF recommendations typically. The idea here is to offer an attractive investment environment for foreign companies to come in and set up shop. But what are they looking for typically in developing countries? Lower wages, lower regulation, and all kinds of incentives, no taxes, um, cheaper electricity, subsidized electricity, subsidized water, lower environmental standards. So it's a, it's a race to the bottom, but it's actually worse than export-oriented growth because foreign direct investment not only brings the foreign capital and the technology and imports the fuel to run the industry, but also takes the profits at the end of the year, and it's usually repatriated to the global north. So it's even more extractive than your standard low-value added content manufacturing and export-led growth. Financial liberalization. This is the idea of essentially opening up your financial market, your stock market, liberalizing it for foreign investors. You typically end up doing this artificially by raising interest rates, by deregulating the financial system, and you end up with the speculative bubble. We've seen this in South Africa. We've seen this in, uh, in Mexico and in, in Turkey and South Korea and other places. It leads to a disaster because you get speculators who are interested in buying low and selling high and then leaving the economy with the, with the big prices. Tourism is a, is a huge problem that is often perceived as the solution to these things. Why? Because tourists come in and they create jobs and they spend, they bring dollars to the economy. But we often don't recognize that the more tourism you have, the more food imports a country has to bring in, the more energy imports you have to bring in to serve the tourists, to heat and cool the hotels, to transport people, and so on. So it ends up being a net negative in many cases. And this is pre-COVID, of course. So tourism itself, unless it's ecological tourism, unless we're talking about a country that has renewable energy security, that has food sovereignty, then tourism becomes a net benefit. But for most countries, we're not there yet. Uh, remittances, reliance on workers uh, uh, working abroad and sending money back home. Well, this produces a brain drain, as uh, most of you probably acknowledge here. So it's not a sustainable strategy to get out of an external debt crisis. So we end up with a race to the bottom, more external debt, and essentially more of the same. Since the 1980s, we've been in, in this perpetual uh, external debt crisis for most developing countries. Um, so we're told there's no alternative, but what I'm suggesting here is that there is an alternative to get out of these structural traps. Um, to give you just one example, this is the composition of Bolivia's exports, and I could have picked any other country, a very similar situation, mostly raw materials, uh, very low value added content of exports, and then you look at the import, it's higher value added content, it's uh, uh, medical equipment, it's cars, it's a lot of food imports, a lot of energy imports and, and so on. So very typical trap for most developing countries. Now you take this on a global scale and you look at the global south versus the global north and you net out all global financial transactions, including aid, including uh, debt payments, exports, imports, foreign direct investment, remittances, all of those financial transactions. The net amount, as you can see here from the, uh, the, the green line right here, and I'm reading it on this axis right here. This is net resource transfers between Global North and Global South. That number right there is $2 trillion, and it's negative, which means $2 trillion are moving from the poorest countries in the world to the richest countries in the world. Now, this is a big problem because presumably the model of economic development was designed to help developing countries after independence catch up with the industrialized world. But what we're seeing here, not only there's no catching up, but we're getting deeper into the trap. Notice this green line is going further and further into the negative territory. Now, there is no way we're gonna put a dent in climate change or any major issues unless we fix this. This is a broken, global financial architecture that sucks trillions of dollars from the poorest countries on a regular basis. So that's one of the pieces of information I wanted to make sure here. Most of you are familiar with this picture, global uh, income distribution, a major problem. But to, to add the climate effects to it, what we find is that uh, 
most CO2 emissions are actually done by the richest uh, countries and the richest individuals in the world. So there is a, there's an added responsibility for repairing the damage to the financial system, repairing the damage when it comes to uh, the planet uh, problem. So now back to this spectrum of monetary sovereignty and let's see where the global south is and where the global north is. The global south is typically in this low degree of monetary sovereignty end of the spectrum. Why? Because of very high levels of external debt um, and the following reasons. So low degree of monetary sovereignty. Uh, the global south is not responsible for climate change. High external, when you look at CO2 emissions since the Industrial Revolution, it's been mostly the global north. The global south has high uh, levels of external debt, low productive capacity to decarbonize the system and build alternative uh, economic systems, low capacity for research and development, because it's not only about building the new technology, it's about actually investing in material science research, energy efficiency, so that we decarbonize the system without destroying more of the ecosystem in terms of extraction of minerals and, and so on. Producing a truly circular economy requires a massive investment in research and development. And the global south suffers from neocolonial extractive economic system that I just described. On the other hand, the global north has, oops, this should say high degree of monetary sovereignty. It's on this end of uh, the spectrum. It is responsible for climate change when you look at most CO2 emissions since the Industrial Revolution. Um, even if you take into account the recent newcomers to the big emitters club, China and India, they're also producing for consumption in the global north. So the, the responsibility is still in the global north. Low to no levels of external debt for most countries on, on this end of the spectrum. Japan's, Japan's national debt, 100% in Japanese yen. U.S. national debt, 100% in U.S. dollars. So no external debt to speak of. High productive capacity, high potential for research and development and benefits. The global north clearly has benefited and continues to benefit from the extraction of resources, financial and real resources from the global north. And that's why I'm talking here about a mechanism for reparations, repairing the broken financial architecture that sucks $2 trillion from the global south, repairing the economic, the global economic infrastructure so that we allow developing countries to truly develop and build productive capacity and gradually move from this end of the spectrum to a higher degree of monetary sovereignty. So I always think of this in terms of reparations, reparations for climate debt, reparations for colonial debt, and reparations doesn't mean simply monetary compensation. It starts with debt cancellation for developing countries. And then you actually have a transfer of financial resources so that the $2 trillion that are moving in the wrong direction start moving in the right direction. And number three, reparations in terms of actually repairing the structures so that we have productive capacity and resilient economies with resilient energy production, renewable energy production, both in the global north and the global south, re resilient agricultural sectors that can produce food sovereignty in, in the global south. And that's where we can actually start putting a dent in climate change and start putting a dent in the, all the global inequities of, that we've been talking about. The question is, how do we pay for it? Where does the money come from? Do we have the capacity to do this without causing inflation, without bankrupting countries and, and so on? So a global Green New Deal, can we afford it? How do we pay for it? This is where the MMT analysis becomes uh, critical. So the standard approach tells us, well, governments are limited in terms of how much they can spend. They can tax, they can borrow maybe a little bit, but beyond that, that's it. We'll, we'll have hyperinflation and we have countries going bankrupt. What MMT is saying is that we have this additional spending capacity, this bright yellow space. That's not infinite. It's constrained. It's limited by the risk of inflation. So as, as an MMT, I become obsessed with the risk of inflation. What actually determines the risk of inflation? And for me, it's two things. One is the lack of productive capacity, logistical capacity, supply chains capacity, uh, labor skills available. Those are the real resources. When we run out of those and we continue to spend, we'll have inflation. The good news about this productive capacity is that it's producible. 
we can create millions of jobs and invest more to increase the productive capacity in strategic areas, in renewables, in research and development, in uh, transportation and agriculture, renewables, and, and so on. So that's the good news. The second component, however, that causes inflation and can fuel and exacerbate inflation pressure points is what I call abusive market power and abusive price setting behavior. That is to say, when you have key players in the system, domestically and internationally, who can raise prices simply because they can. When you think of the global food system, we literally have five global mega corporations that control the entire global food supply system. And of course, they use their market power and they abuse their market power. So how do we tame that risk of inflation that comes out of abusive market power? You don't reduce it by not spending by implementing austerity and saying there's nothing we can do, you tame the risk of inflation from abusive market power by taxing and regulating their abusive market power out of existence, by applying antitrust laws, by democratizing those markets and making them more competitive. And that is fundamentally a question of political choice. That is a question of democracy. Do we have governments of the people, by the people, for the people, or governments of the corporations, for the corporations, and, and so on? And, and it's a question of democracy. It's a question of corruption. It's a, a question of the influence, the power and influence of oligarchical powers in the democratic process. So these are the real constraints. It's not about finding the money like uh, Stephanie Kelton just explained. It's about finding, finding the votes to implement and fund the real strategic choices. That includes spending strategically where capacity is lacking and taxing and regulating abuse of power when, uh, as, as needed. And that's the paradigm shift that MMT is, is proposing. Now, the issue of inflation, as I just explained, is not about finding the money, is not about any of this. And yet we have central bankers around the world since the 2008 financial crisis essentially admitting that they have no reliable theory of inflation. And yet they're still convinced they can target inflation, even today. What are we going to do in the US and the rest of the world? Everybody's saying, we're going to raise interest rates to tame the sources of inflation and to fight this COVID-induced inflation. When the actual inflation pressure points that we're experiencing right now are way outside the jurisdiction of the central bank. In Tunisia and most developing countries, the sources of inflation are food imports and energy imports. Energy imports controlled by OPEC. Food imports are controlled by five global corporations. Now, how can the central bank of a small developing country raise interest rates domestically in the hope that it will convince OPEC to lower oil prices or in the hope that it will convince the five mega corporations that control food prices that they should lower their, their prices? It's got nothing to do with it. Inflation is way outside their jurisdiction and yet they believe that they can cause so much economic pain to, to their own people in the hope of targeting inflation and aiming inflation. So I usually use this gift just to give you an idea of what central bankers are, are doing. Here's the ECB trying to target inflation for a decade. And it's not even funny. It's all over the place. These are the ECB uh, expectations or expected inflation uh, rates. And this is the real inflation rate. It's got nothing to do with it. It's managed and, 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 uh, and created in a space that's way outside their, their jurisdiction. So what I'd like to suggest, and this is counterintuitive, so bear with me here, is that from an MMT perspective, increasing government spending can actually fight inflation. Whereas the mainstream is telling us, if you have more government spending, it will cause inflation. They're blaming the COVID inflation that we're experiencing right now on federal spending to help the poor, the unemployed, people displaced with the pandemic. And so hear me out. Here's the mainstream narrative. They say, this can't happen. This, not, this doesn't make any sense. So here's how they explain it. They say, let's say a country like Tunisia wants to spend 2 billion dinars on health and education, two important sectors in domestic currency. This is not external debt or anything like that. They say, here's what's going to happen. More imports of food and energy and medical equipment. We're going to have a larger trade deficit. It's going to lead to a weaker exchange rate, the dinar relative to the dollar and the euro. And we're going to have a pass-through inflation effect. In other words, everything the country imports, food, medicine, and so on, is going to be more expensive 
with the effects of a weaker exchange rate. Uh, we're going to have more external debt because now the central bank has to fight this inflation and borrow more. The IMF and foreign lenders will step in and say, spending cuts, austerity, you can't do this. You have a debt crisis. So we're going to have less investment in health and education. We're back to square one. And we're going to have more unemployment, more brain drain, more social, economic, political tensions, more of the same. And they're going to say, we told you, there is no alternative. Haven't you heard, you know, Margaret Thatcher since the 80s saying there is no alternative to austerity, to all of this stuff. Now, here's scenario number two, the MMT approach to actually fighting inflation in a developing country. We're going to spend the same amount, 2 billion dinars in the case of Tunisia, except now we're going to spend 1 billion dinars on health and education. And then we're going to spend the second billion dinars on increasing domestic productive capacity in food production, renewable energy production, renewable energy efficiency, and crack down on corruption, abusive price setters, importers of luxury goods via taxation and regulation. So the same amount of spending, except with a different composition, with a different strategic focus. Here's the impact. Fewer imports of food and energy, which means a lower trade deficit which means stable or even stronger exchange rate over time, which means no imported inflation, which means lower external debt, higher credit ratings for the country, an increase in foreign currency reserves, which gives the central bank more firepower, more resilience to external shocks in the future related to food and energy prices, and lower carbon footprint because you're producing renewables and you're producing domestically, more employment, less brain drain, improved quality of life, for all. Now we're talking. So we spend more to tame the sources of inflation, not to fuel the sources of inflation. So now what is the limit to the spending? Is it actually 2 billion dinars? Maybe it's three, maybe it's four, maybe it's seven. What determines the real limit of how much the government can spend in this particular case is the availability of real resources. Do we have the skilled labor? Do we have the logistical capabilities? Do we have the real resources? Do we have the administrative uh, managerial capabilities to expand and scale up this type of uh, intervention? And that's what determines the real capacity of, of, uh, of spending. It's not borrowing externally. It's not finding the money, so to speak. The last thing I wanna add here to close this and kind of open it up to a broader conversation is the importance of industrial strategies. And this is typically a problem for small developing countries because you can't really industrialize if you have a, a market, a domestic market of 10 million consumers. You need to hit economies of scale. In other words, you need to produce on a larger scale. And when you do that, you don't have enough of your consumers domestically. So you have to export. You have to compete with Germany and Japan and so on. And it's too late to break into those markets uh, today. So how do you industrialize more strategically? And this is why I always emphasize the importance of South-South strategic partnerships, large trading blocks in the global South with complementary resources and capabilities, making a priority list for the industries that they actually need for their internal resilience. And those industries will allow you to scale up to hit those economies of scale and build these horizontal linkages that allow you to capture more and more value added content within the trading block. And you focus on collective resilience. You start with food security, renewable energy security, water security, education, training, healthcare. These are the productive capacity priorities that you need to prioritize on a regional scale. And if that means partnership with some countries in the global north, so be it. This doesn't have to be exclusive, but it has to be resilience-based and it has to be aimed at repairing the structural damage that I described earlier. And this is how a country over time acquires a higher degree of economic and monetary sovereignty. And if a country or regional bloc lacks this very basic level of resilience, it has no bargaining chips, it can't walk away from a negotiation table for trade agreements or anything with the global north, and it will continue to lose its economic and, and monetary sovereignty. So to conclude, we have less than 10 years to go, maybe eight years to transform the global economy, to tackle the, the key problems that we have on, on the climate front, and we're not gonna be able to do it with the current policies. The current 
uh, climate uh, policies, inequality, uh, we have all of these multiple crises that require bold transformative action. And the current uh, climate jobs policies are too weak, too slow, too expensive, ineffective, and, and dangerous, literally dangerous when it comes to the impact of climate change. A global Green New Deal, so not the U.S. context Green Deal, with climate and colonial reparations in the, in the sense that I described today is possible, desirable, and affordable. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you again. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was a great look at monetary theory. Uh, outside of the U.S. context. Um, we have a lot of questions in the chat, so I'm going to just read some of them off that have like the uh, the most like amount of upvotes. Um, please feel free to keep sending questions to the chat. And um, in regards to answering the questions, feel either of you uh, can feel free to take the question. Both of you can answer. If one of you feels like one, one answers it uh, sufficiently, we can go on to the next one. Um, so it can be very uh, conversational and casual how we handle the questions. So let's see. Okay, so one question here uh, from Lindsay Fernandez is, do you believe this understanding of the deficit as described by modern monetary theory is something that our elected representatives are already aware of and genuinely, uh, and genuinely skeptical of or something that they reject as more of a talking point? You want me to jump in with this one? Yeah, that's uh, all you, Stephanie. Well, so, the answer to the first part of the question is an unequivocal yes. It is something that they are aware of. Um, so after the 2020 election, the Congressional Progressive Caucus has a Tuesday call, just a, a routine call every Tuesday. They often invite someone in to join the call and speak with members of the caucus. The caucus has about 100 members. And the first Tuesday after President uh, after Biden was uh, elected, they invited me to join that call and to talk MMT with members of the Progressive Caucus. Now, this was definitely not the first time that I had talked with members of the House or Senate, but it was the largest single gathering, right? I've presented in Zooms to a couple of dozen. I've joined lawmakers on the Hill for dinners and presentations. And I've, uh, I've worked in the Senate. And, and so I know that there are many people who are in one of three categories, maybe, you know, aware and highly supportive, aware and interested in learning, aware, skeptical, okay, four categories, aware, hostile. And so, uh, the aware hostel, the interesting thing about the aware hostel group is that they run economic policy as if they've already embraced MMT. They just don't want progressives or Democrats deploying the power of the purse in pursuit of a progressive agenda or an agenda that serves a broader constituency. Uh, they like very much just, you know, keeping this to themselves and doing huge tax cuts and other things that make use of the deficit to serve a narrow constituency for whom they feel beholden, uh, but they don't really want Democrats catching on to the game. So if I'm obviously talking about tax cuts and so forth. And, you know, there was a, a small number of Republicans in the House and in the Senate who have more than once introduced legislation to condemn modern monetary theory. The most recent attempt in the Senate was uh, an effort to condemn modern monetary theory by um, uh, unanimous consent, which means if you introduce a resolution like that and you ask for unanimous consent, if nobody comes forward to object, then it just passes and it would be in the congressional record that the United States Senate had voted with unanimous consent to condemn modern monetary theory. So there was uh, an intervention. And in this case, Senator Bernie Sanders went down and objected and so prevented that from happening. But anyway, 
there are a lot of people who are extremely supportive. I think I would put at the top of the list, the chairman of the House Budget Committee, John Yarmouth, who has done more in an open way to publicly embrace MMT than I think any other member of Congress. But uh, there are lots and lots of people who either quietly uh, or not so quietly are, are supportive of the work that we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll just add one one thing here, which is, you know, the, the 535 people that we're talking about here in Washington, D.C., they have the power of the purse. And what we're saying is that they can spend strategically to tackle climate change, inequality, child poverty, and all of that, but also tax and regulate abusive market power. And that's the part that they're, some of them at least, are not willing to do, because you'll be essentially you know, taxing and regulating super PACs that bankroll the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and so many of your elections. And here it's a question of democracy. This is a question of, is it a government of the people, by the people, for the people, or not? So when we're talking about, you know, the power of the purse and all of these things being actually within reach, the real obstacle is not finding the money. It's not about finding the engineering capabilities and the raw materials and, and the logistical capabilities to actually tackle climate change and build a resilient grid. We know how to do this. We, we put a man on the moon. We won World War II. We know how to get big things done, even with very limited financial resources. And most people think limited financial resources. World War II came right after the Great Depression. There was no money to be taxed, no money to be borrowed. How did we go from the most miserable time to the biggest government intervention in the history of the universe and winning the biggest war of all, right? It wasn't because we taxed somebody or borrowed somebody. That was the easy part of the question. All the economists and policymakers of the time were thinking, where are we going to find the aircraft manufacturers to produce enough jet fighters and tanks and uh, ammunition to win this thing? If we were thinking during World War II to go into this thing in an incremental way, like many people say, like send 10,000 troops every other month and see if we can win this thing, we'd be speaking German today. How did we do it? We set the priorities straight. We focused on the real productive capacity. We shut down Detroit and we told Detroit, stop producing cars, start producing tanks. And we did it. For, for three years, we completely retooled the productive capacity. Then the concern was the risk of inflation. All of those workers we hire to build those tanks and airplanes, we pay them decent wages. In a free country, they should be able to go out and buy a car or a house or whatever they want. But they couldn't because we didn't have new cars, new houses. So the concern was, how do we tame that potential risk of inflation? Well, we leveraged the political mood of the nation and we convinced them to postpone their consumption until after the war. Not because we needed their money, so yes, they invested in freedom bonds and war bonds, not to fund the war, the war was already funded, but to postpone their demand for consumer goods until after the war. And what happened after the war? We had plenty of capabilities to build homes and build cars, but guess what? We didn't have enough productive capacity to produce furniture to put in those homes. So what did uh, Boeing do? After the war, they converted their productive capacity from producing tanks and airplane engines to producing furniture, literally furniture. So we know how to manage big, massive intervention without causing inflation and with achieving those, those targets. All of those were political decisions, carefully uh, made strategic decisions. It's just today they told us, oh, we can't do that. Well, we just did it with COVID, right? $2.2 trillion appeared. Nobody objected to it because it was a national priority. And the concern was the availability of real productive capacity, doctors, nurses, hospital beds, vaccines. That was the problem. It wasn't finding the money. And yet today, two years later, they look back and tell us, oh, this inflation we're experiencing, it's not because big, you know, cartels are raising prices because they can, because logistical disruptions to the global supply chain. No, 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 no. We're going to blame it on poor kids that we supported with the tax credit. We're going to blame it on the unemployed and people displaced because we gave so much of that government spending. So it's very important for us to, you know, 
not allow the narrative to be hijacked yet again about what actually causes inflation and call their bluff. And MMT shines this bright light and allows us to call their bluff and allows us to democratize the public policy decision-making process, truly democratize it, not leave it in the hands of power and influence of a handful of lobbyists and, and corporate influencers who can convince a big chunk of the Senate, of Congress, to do as they please. Awesome. Thank you for that answer, guys. Um, next question is, how is it exactly that the trade deficit of a country leads to inflation? Does it always do this? Um, and does it have to do with whether the debt is uh, based in a foreign currency or not? And again, like why does this deficit necessarily lead to inflation? Uh, I'll take this one. So a, a trade deficit doesn't always lead to inflation. So the, the countries I was describing um, were their trade deficit was forcing them into a situation to borrow in foreign currencies in order to stabilize the exchange rate. And they had to do it because it was concentrated in key areas of vulnerability, food imports, energy imports, medical imports, typically high value added content of manufacturing. But a country like the US, we have a large trade deficit and we never borrow and promise to pay in foreign currencies. Anything that's available for sale in the world for US dollars, we can afford it as a, as a nation. So we don't have a problem with the, with the trade deficit in, in the US. Uh, countries also that have relatively large trade deficits but happen to be able to offset them with foreign direct investment into their financial system uh, or, or are able to pay for their food deficits and energy deficits with, with other exports, they don't have to worry about this. They don't have to go into uh, a currency crisis. They don't have to go into an external debt crisis. So that's why I emphasize in the case of developing countries, you can't run an economy without food. You can't run an economy without energy. And if you don't have the resilience and, and the sovereignty in the food sector and the energy sector, you have to import those and now you're in trouble because the rest of your economy is not productive enough to offset your need for, for imports. I'll give you an example. Saudi Arabia is, is a big energy exporter, oil exporter, uh, but it also has very weak um, vulnerability in the food sector very weak productive capacity and almost everything else. So it can temporarily or artificially kind of hide its vulnerability as long as there's oil revenues. But if you take away the oil sector, the Saudi economy looks like most developing countries, has no food sovereignty, has low value added content of manufacturing and its currency will depreciate and it will quickly turn into uh, a, a, net, a net energy importer. If, if the rest of the world decarbonizes and oil is no longer needed, Saudi Arabia will, will turn into an energy importer, will have to decarbonize its economy and will face currency depreciation, will face a debt crisis like many developing countries. So that doesn't mean that you have to be a, a big energy exporter or a big food exporter to build that resilience. Uh, but you have to balance your economy based on uh, key factors of resilience that allow you to withstand external shocks without having to implement austerity measures and, and throw your people under the bus. Great, thank you. Um, next question is, why would the global North want to change uh, this system that they benefit uh, from so much in terms of uh, extraction from the global south. Um, how can we convince the U.S. to take on policies um, that would change that relationship? Well, actually, the current situation happening in the Ukraine is case in point. Had Germany and Western Europe had renewable energy capacity, had they started investing massively in decarbonizing the system, we wouldn't be in this uh, pickle with uh, Germany and Western Europe essentially having to continue buying oil and gas from Russia, despite the conflictual relationship that they have in terms of uh, the invasion of the Ukraine and, and so on. So that's one, it's just a geopolitical mess when you have to depend on a country like Russia or any other country 
uh, and it completely changes your sovereignty, right? From in terms of your, your political beliefs, your philosophical beliefs of what's, of what's right and what's wrong. That's point number one. Point number two, there is a, a concept that um, uh, several colleagues for decades now have been working on. It's called the carbon bubble, right? You're familiar with the stock market bubble, overvalued assets. Well, the carbon bubble refers to stock market value, uh, financial assets that are overinflated because of the impact of fo the fossil fuel industry. And with the impact of climate change, as we decarbonize, we're gonna make those assets, what we call stranded assets, useless assets that will lose a bunch of value. For example, if you invest today in coastal properties and hotels and resorts and, and coastal areas that will be hit with the impact of climate change. A flooded hotel is worth nothing. A flooded hotel doesn't generate a revenue stream. So that becomes a stranded asset and that its value will deflate. That's, that's the carbon bubble. All the oil and gas infrastructure that we're building as we speak today will become stranded assets as we actually take action and start to decarbonize the system. So there is a, a built-in incentive from the financial aspect to actually uh, start deleveraging the balance sheets of your pension fund, of your university endowment is probably packed with climate risk as we speak. So there's an incentive in the global north because the biggest impact of the carbon bubble will be in the global north. Number two, there's a thing we call climate refugees. You know, there's a, a, a few, you know, hundred thousand refugees from Syria and other parts of the world caused a, a panic in 2015 and 2016 in, in Europe. Just wait for the actual impact of climate change. And this is not me saying it. The, the World Bank, who are not known as the tree huggers of the world, their estimates for millions and millions of people from the global south will be moving in the next, by 2050 because of the impact of climate change. Do we have the resilient infrastructure in the global north to welcome millions of refugees? The schools, the, the food capacity, the transportation, the energy, the, the housing capacity, we're not even close. So yes, we do have an incentive to fix this. And number three, as I said earlier, it's the moral ethical responsibility that we have. We've caused most of the damage in the global south and we have the moral ethical responsibility to fix it. The good news is that we do have the spending capacity, as I explained, the, the, the fiscal capacity. We do have the research and development capacity. We do have all that it takes to actually do the right thing and fix this broken system. Awesome, thank you. Um... Next question is, how would studying the economic impact of legislation be done differently in a world where MMT is fully embraced, as opposed to how it is currently do uh, done with the CBO? Well, so as somebody who served on the Senate Budget Committee and participated in drafting legislation and working with other staffers who were drafting legislation, I can tell you this, in my time working in the Senate, I do not believe I ever heard once a staffer or a member of the United States Senate talk about inflation in the same breath as they were talking about, you know, uh, whether to vote for a trillion dollar infrastructure package or support it or something like that. It's not that it's an afterthought, it's that it is not a thought at all. It's not part of the calculus. It's, you know, inflation is the Federal Reserve's thing. And Congress doesn't believe that it needs to pause at any moment and think about whether major legislation that they're thinking about voting for carries inflation risk, whether these things they call pay-fors, you know, the, this, the way that we describe a pay-for is completely wrongheaded. The idea is when a bill is paid for, it means if you're proposing to spend, let's say a trillion dollars doing infrastructure investments or whatever, that you have a plan to remove a trillion dollars from some other part of the economy, either by reducing spending in some other category of the budget or by raising taxes so that you generate a trillion dollars in revenue so that you can go to the Congressional Budget Office, say, here's my bill, 
will you evaluate this and tell me if it's a good bill? I, did I do a good job? And CBO takes it and cares really about one big thing. What are the budgetary impacts of the proposed legislation? So if CBO's analysis shows that this can be carried out and it won't increase the deficit, it won't add to the debt, CBO assigns it a good score. And lawmakers think, oh, we did a very good job. We wrote a good bill. It's fiscally responsible. It doesn't increase deficit or add to the debt. And MMT says, no, 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 You're, this, is a, this is the wrong way to think about this, right? What you want is to back your way into these so-called pay-fors. And I would stop calling them that because it's misleading. I would just call them offsets. You want to back your way into the offsets. I would start with the presumption that you may not need the offsets at all. There might be enough fiscal space available to allow you to do whatever it is you want to do without the need to offset the spending in any way. Start there, right? If it's a small bill, sometimes there are bills for like a $5 billion investment in a youth job program or something. There's a very good chance that you can do that without the need for offsets. But if you, the bigger you get, is certainly as you move toward, you know, Green New Deal or something like that, you're going to have to think a lot harder and the offsets are going to become important as, you know, depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish. So how do you do that? You evaluate the legislation, looking at the impacts and strains and stresses on the productive capacity. You know, if you, if you want to do a big infrastructure program, you know that you need architects, engineers, construction workers, you know you need heavy equipment and steel and concrete. So one of the things you want to do, you know, in the old days, they would do input output analysis. I would bring that back. I, and I can't get into that and still allow other people to get questions in. But that's one way to start thinking about this. You got to vet the proposed legislation in a way that says, can I carry this out with the resource capacity, right, that I have available, uh, or do I need to create some offsets to free up resources to prevent the spending from being inflationary? Maybe I have to turn a three-year infrastructure program into a five-year, stretch it into seven years, depending on, you know, how the analysis turns out. And the same would be true of you know, free college or anything else you need to do. You've got to ask the question, how will you resource it in real terms, not how will you pay for it? And so we need just a fundamental overhaul of the federal budgeting process, um, vetting proposed legislation, not for the budgetary impacts, but for the potential inflation risk. And, you know, I, I still think that one of the best places to start with an analysis like that is with the old input-output um, framework used to be adopted during and after World War II. Some countries still do it. Brazil still does a lot of input-output analysis. Absolutely. I'll second that. Oh, yeah. So, you know, we're, we're, I think we've talked here about modern monetary theory from I think more of a progressive uh, sort of left-wing perspective but I think it, it applies to the you know macroeconomics in general and also someone who's might, might have a more of a sort of a libertarian or right-wing lean might also you know kind of use modern monetary theory to kind of push forward their uh, uh, policies. So how would you say, like, see something like a tax cut or something more of a libertarian uh, policy proposal? How would you see it from an MMT uh, uh, approach? And how, or how would you support it from an MMT approach? I think exactly the same way that you could support any other policy. You know, we're going to have differences of opinion when it comes to how to best use the available fiscal space. But you're quite right, you know, if, if MMT is a lens or a framework, if I'm an optometrist, my job is to, you know, see patients and send them out with 
vision that's as close to 2020 as I can get them. I don't invite the patient in and sit down and ask about their politics and what they're going to do when I fix their vision. Are they going to go out and knock off a convenience store? Are they going to go help an old lady across the street, right? I don't know what they're going to do, but my job is to give them a clearer picture uh, and send them off. And in a sense, you know, with policymakers, that's one thing that we're trying to accomplish is to just give a clearer picture of how, how the monetary system works, the mechanics of the federal budget, and how it all works, where the real limits are, where the imaginary limits are, sort of clear, clear through the fog so that everybody can see more clearly and we can have a more productive debate. But we're still going to have a debate. And a, we live in a democracy. We're going to elect sometimes Republicans will be in control of the House, the Senate, the White House, sometimes Democrats will be in control. And we're going to get the policies that our elected representatives vote for at any future point in time. I think the hope and the goal, at least for me, is that MMT first pushes us to a place where more of us can participate in a democratic way, right, in the debates and not be bamboozled by lawmakers who tell us, oh, sure, we'd love to be able to tackle climate change and so forth, but there's no money, right? Let's empower people to have an understanding of how it all works so that they can participate more effectively in those debates, push back against you know, lawmakers who try to pass that sort of a line. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we get the people and the policies that we vote for in a sense, you know, whatever comes out of the electoral process. And, and hopefully we end up, MMT helps us get into a position where we understand how much better off we could be, how much more we could do to improve life and, uh, and deal with the, as I said, the deficits that matter, but there's nothing to prevent someone from applying the MMT lens in the pursuit of building board, you know, build a wall or whatever else. They, they don't need MMT as a justification to do that. Um, if the votes are there, they can do that regardless. Yeah. Uh, one, 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 one more question. question. So I think uh, we mentioned a little bit, you know, the Federal Reserve or Central Bank. Could you speak a little bit about what a, what a central bank does or the Federal Reserve in the U.S., what it does within the, 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 the financial system that we have? And what, what do you think the proper role of a central bank uh, should be in a, in a system that's uh, where policymakers are informed by MMT? I can say something very quick and then I think we should let Fadl say something. Right now, the Fed mostly relies on an interest rate tool to di try to dial up and down uh, economic activity, the level of economic activity, targeting inflation and basically economic growth, right? Striving for some sort of balance between the level of employment in the economy and the inflation rate. And they mostly have this tool called the interest rate that they push up and down in the hope of influencing the level of economic activity. And what it basically results in is holding a certain subset of people in society in unemployment, right? For the purpose of taming inflationary pressures. And right now, what we see is the Fed basically saying inflation is too high, it's above target. We're gonna use our tool to try to bring inflation down. They don't normally say as candidly as I'm going to how they're gonna do that, but how they're going to do that, they hope, is by slowing the economy in a way that results in a less tight labor market, or in other words, fewer people having jobs. So in an MMT framework, we would prefer not to have the Fed using interest rates, relying on interest rates and unemployment to manage inflationary pressures, we would introduce a federal job guarantee program to provide an automatic stabilizer that anchors the wage, provides some price stability, and let the central bank focus on things like 
regulating and supervising the financial system. Okay, there are other tools that the Fed can develop to manage inflationary pressures. And there's a new report out by Nathan Tankus, I think through the Modern Monetary or Modern Money Network, and people can look at that report if they're interested in uh, a very beefy sort of statement about how uh, you can think about the Fed and what monetary policy could do differently. Um, but Fado, what do you wanna say? I completely agree with everything you said. I'll just add a couple of things that the Fed uh, can do on, on the climate front, at least in, within its jurisdiction. And there's, the Fed is, has a very important regulatory role in terms of regulating the, the financial institutions, the speculative behavior, and the composition of their balance sheets. For example, many people have been arguing now for decades in the, in the green finance space that central banks should change the capital adequacy requirement, which they regulate and financial institutions must report to the Fed. That is the composition of their capital. And we need to separate the green capital requirement from the fossil fuel-based capital requirement, which, as I described earlier, will be impacted by climate change. One of the things that the Fed can do tomorrow morning is change that capital adequacy requirement and by lowering the green composition of that capital requirement and keeping the same or raising the fossil fuel-based or the carbon-based capital requirement. And when you do that, you automatically create an incentive for financial institutions to deleverage their investments in the fossil fuel industry and the carbon-based industry and to accelerate their commitment and investment to a greener, more resilient uh, economy, because that would make it more profitable. And of course, banks are not gonna do it because they're, they want to save the world. They're only gonna do it if you make them. And if you make it a standard, all of them have to compete based on the same, on the same standard. So there are so many things that the Fed can do to address some of these problems, but the biggest firepower and the biggest inflation management capacity is actually in the hands of the fiscal authorities to tax and regulate, to invest strategically in productive capacity. The Fed can't build renewable energy capacity. The Fed can't tax and regulate the power of pharmaceuticals. That's Congress, that's their jurisdiction. So the Fed can set up a much more efficient, inclusive financial system Today, we have more than 30 million Americans who were excluded from the financial system, the unbanked and underbanked people. The Fed can use the most um, efficient, available to us digital infrastructure that we have today, digital wallets to set up um, bank accounts for anybody and be able to much more, uh, to be able to uh, create inclusivity in the financial system and facilitate also fiscal policy intervention during a pandemic, facilitate uh, tax refund transfers, facilitate all kinds of things. But this idea that the Fed will use the single policy tool interest rates and will let loose of everything else, let the financial system rule, is, is an ideological setup that's been established over the last few decades that MMT is, is challenging. We're saying you have firepower, you have regulatory power, but the fiscal authorities have much bigger regulatory powers, much bigger firepower in terms of its intervention in the system. And you need both. It's not just the Fed fixing the system. It's not just Congress. You need both to coordinate uh, the policy action that we're describing today. Great. Um, and I just wanted to ask, uh, thank you for answering that. I just wanted to ask really quick if you guys could just give some brief uh, closing remarks and then we'll be finished up uh, for today. Well, I'm brief is brief is okay. I just want to say thank you. I uh, I think that Fadal and I are both very excited about where we can go when we're able to bring, you know, our expertise and insights into how the monetary system works and how the government budget works to people like you who have maybe the big ideas that we all need, whether it's, you know, talking with groups that work to advance, you know, an agenda around 
getting health care to every American, or whether it's talking with groups that care passionately about climate and, um, you know, uh, inequality, and whatever the organization is, when we have an opportunity to step outside of, you know, the narrow economics discipline and engage with um, people like you, I think this is the most rewarding, I'll speak personally, uh, this is the most re rewarding part of what I get to do, because this is where the seeds can really germinate and the future can start to look very bright, I hope. So thanks very much for letting us come and spend some time with you. I'll, I'll echo the same uh, sentiment about how important it is to cross-fertilize these ideas from, from the MMT space into, into other areas, especially science and technology. Because when we talk about the, uh, the real resources, the productive capacity, the research and development needs for the economy, we're not saying we can't afford it, so we should stop all research and development. Think of uh, when JFK said we're going to send a man to the moon. And the science wasn't there, but we made it a national priority. And we put the brain power and the financial resources to make it happen. And look at all the technological advances that came out of that space program that wasn't even intended from the beginning. So we need to think in a similar way today about climate change, about the big national priorities. Put the resources on the table, put the brain power and the research and development capabilities to set that priority as the ultimate thing to save our lives, literally to save our lives. And don't worry about finding the money. We know where to find the money. We know how to find the votes. The current political system has hijacked the narrative about the financial capacity of the government. So with a webinar like this, with um, more people empowered with this MMT lens, you can call their bluff when they say we don't have the money. And you can push back and say, yes, we do have the research and development capacity. We need the funding. And now you need to do your job to tax and regulate abusive market power from the oligarchs who support your campaigns. And we need to be able to call them out on this. You need to save democracy. We need a clean new deal in addition to a green new deal when it comes to the democratic process. And once we have the priority straight, it doesn't matter who's Republican and who's Democrat in Washington, D.C., as long as we believe in the same values. And I think most people believe in the same values, even fiscally conservative friends who identify as Republicans, they know that we can't afford all of this health, negative health effect associated with climate change. I mean, wouldn't you rather spend money up front for clean energy and clean water sources or not do it because it's too expensive because we don't have the money and then pay for cancer treatment for everybody for the next 30 years? as if that's cheap and affordable. We're already paying for it with blood, tears, and money. So MMT is saying the cost of doing the right thing is actually much cheaper, much more affordable and humane than the cost of inaction, which is what we're doing right now. So learning this framework allows us to use this lens, shine a bright light on the actual world of possibilities, which is within reach, and call their bluff when they say we can't afford it. Thank you again. Thank you guys so much for coming to speak to our uh, organization and the audience at large. And thank you to everybody who turned out today. Uh, this was great. And I'm so excited we got to kick off the series with such two strong uh, talks. Everybody have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much.